Okay. Welcome to the folks who are joining us now. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're just getting set up and we'll be getting started in about four minutes or so. And a heads up for anyone who's joining, um, if you would like to chat, and I'll repeat this again later, um, but if you'd like to chat with everyone, oh, and we're on YouTube now. That's nice, hold on. There we go. Um, so if you're on Zoom and you wanna chat, just make sure that when you open the chat window, you switch that little blue bar from all panelists. It might not be blue, it might be white. Um, the little bar from all panelists to all panelists and attendees, if you wanna to talk to everybody um, and not just the three of us. Feel free to roll call and jump in with where you're joining from tonight as well. We always like to see where folks are coming from. Same goes on YouTube if there's anyone on YouTube right now. Let's see. <laughs> okay, and there, uh, Alondria, I've just sent you the link. Thank you. Have either of you gotten out observing in the past couple of days? No. Uh, not quite. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've, heard it's, I've heard it's been cloudy out in BC, eh? Yeah, it's uh, probably my 12 years of living here. It's probably one of the sort of rainiest, cloudiest summers so far that I've uh, that we witnessed. Yeah. It's good for wildfires, though. There's, I don't think there's been a, any of those going on. That's true. That's good. We actually, we had a fire, um, not here in Ontario, but uh, our telescope's in California, and there was a fire in California uh, last week, and it oh. took out the power to the telescope. It was a new problem that we hadn't dealt with before. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, everyone, nice to see you joining. All righty. There we go. Um, I got it. <clears throat> so I'm very new to observing and I'm really looking forward to your talk, Robert, because okay. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> um, but I got out last night and not last night, two nights ago and, um, and saw the ring nebula for the first time, which I was very excited about. Sweet. Yeah. I've heard about it for a while and I was expecting it to be hard to find. And then I pointed my finder scope at the generally right area and there it was. And it was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it was very exciting. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Have you seen the dumbbell nebula yet? No, I have to do that because it's right next, right next door ish, right? Yeah, well, it's in uh, Volpecula, or okay, it's actually yeah. closer to Sagitta, but uh, that's that will one will really blow you away. Okay, cool. I've seen it in somebody else's <laughs> scope, but I don't count mm -hmm. that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, mostly because I really just I the joy for me comes from finding it on my own. Right. Do you, I, I take it you star hop? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I haven't someday I did I did find the very first time when I set up my scope for the first time I did use the go to feature to find M13 because I was like <laughs> I don't I, I like I can't even find the constellations. <laughs> um, uh, but then I, I went back and I made sure that I star hopped to it to make sure that I could find it if I needed to. <laughs> okay, so you actually star hop <laughs> with your do you so you do you star hop with your go to scope then just using kind of like the keypad? Yeah. Okay, that's what I did uh, yeah. when I first started because my first telescope was a go to scope and after about a week or so I'm like this isn't fun anymore so I actually started to do the same thing that you were doing. <laughs> it's so much more fun and satisfying yeah. when you find it on your own. No? Definitely. Yeah, it was I the, the very first time that I observed anything it was um, up here I so saw I'm on Manitoulin Island right now, um, which is nice mm -hmm. and dark it's a couple hours north of Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I bought binoculars I'd been working at the RASC for a couple couple months at that point, I think. And I bought binoculars specifically for observing. And I'd never really observed before. And I went out because I knew where the Andromeda galaxy was. And I went out to look for it. And it took me about 10 minutes and I found it. And I immediately dropped my binoculars and was like, that was a fluke. I should try again. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and found it again. And I was like, okay, it wasn't an accident. I didn't know where it was. <laughs> hey, everybody who's uh, joining. I'm going to just mention again, um, that if you are joining on Zoom, please do change that little bar in the chat window from all panelists to all panelists and attendees, uh, because right now you're all talking to us, which we really like, uh, but we'd like for you to all talk to everyone as well, because there's a good number of you from all over the place. We've got Dartmouth and Mississauga. Um, so please join with that and get chatting with everyone. Um, and then uh, chime in on YouTube as well if, you, uh, if you're on there. Alrighty, and it's seven o'clock, so I'm going to Hmm. I'll get started slowly. 
Um, so hey everyone, I'm Jenna. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada uh, at our national office. And we've been hosting a series, a speaker series with members and uh, speakers from across the country at our various centers. And today we have Robert Conrad, who is the observing chair at RASC Vancouver. So the Vancouver Center RISC. Uh, Vancouver Center RISC just hosted the annual General Assembly and the uh, and that was all virtual, which is the first time I believe ever that we've hosted a virtual uh, GA, which was very exciting. Um, and that's all available on our YouTube channel if you haven't seen it and would like to go back and check. Um, I believe, is RASC Vancouver still hosting events for that? They hosted them throughout June. Yeah, I actually did one as well. So uh, you can, oh, you can find that one. I did, I, I did it with one of my co-chairs uh, at RASC, so. Amazing, okay, great. Yeah. It was so all on then, star hopping too. Oh, perfect. I love star hopping. Star hopping is great. Um, so today our guest is, well, first of all, we have Alendria here from Sky News as well, as per usual. Hello, Alendria. Hello, Jenna. Hi, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would like to introduce our speaker for this week. Uh, and our speaker is Robert Conrad, who is the observing chair at Vancouver. So uh, Robert, without further ado, I know is a, he's a fantastic instructor and he knows tons about observing. And so I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about observing and welcome our new guests who have maybe joined us because of Neowise. Super, thanks a lot, Jenna. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, taking time out this evening to uh, participate in this uh, webinar. I'm really excited to do these. I do a lot of these, so um, I'm definitely well oiled uh, for, for doing this and I'm really excited to, to, to bring all of my knowledge uh, to you. But as Einstein actually said that, uh, you know, knowledge is one thing, but really, it you know, experience is everything. So what I'm about to talk to you about tonight, please don't just take it from a theoretical point of view, but actually go out and put it to use. And the good news is uh, most of what I'm gonna be talking about tonight, actually probably 99% of what I'll be talking about tonight is something that you can actually put into practice. Not only, this is a bit of a surprise for you, but I'm gonna be providing you with quick reference guides uh, for astronomy that will help you in observational astronomy that I that have literally taken me hundreds, if not even a few, maybe a couple thousand hours actually to create. I'm going to give those to you completely free tonight. Um, so um, that's so again, make sure that you use all these different resources and and uh, put them into practice. So at some point, I'll be pasting that uh, link in the text chat for you. I'm not going to do it now because I think if I do it now, you're going to probably go off and look at all the stuff uh, instead of listening to me. So I'll, I'll wait a bit, um, but I will paste that uh, at some point in the in the text chat. And that link is a link to my Google Drive where I have all of these different resources uh, that I've created. Now I'll refer you to them as I go through the webinar uh, tonight. So let me uh, share my screen here so I can uh, put up. Uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, but before I actually get into uh, that, I just want to mention as well that, that uh, this is a group, even if you're not from Vancouver, this is a meetup group that you might want to consider actually joining or keeping your eye on from time to time. It's called the Vancouver Astronomy Meetup Group. And the reason for that is because I'm quite active in that group. Uh, quite a few times a month, I will actually do webinars and, and seminars and, and little pieces of courses that I've taught through virtual means through this group. So it's, it's a good opportunity. And I know some of the people on this call actually uh, have attended those uh, over the last uh, couple of months. So uh, something to keep in mind. The other uh, thing that I want to draw your attention to is, uh, is a Facebook group that I created back when I was living in uh, Whistler. And uh, it's interesting because when I took over this group, I think there was only like maybe 10 or 12 people in the group. And over a couple of years, I was able to uh, grow it to what is it now? I think it's uh, 863. So that's 863 uh, members who you can actually ask questions and you can uh, chat with all about astronomy. And the other nice thing that I do is on this group, uh, I will actually post things every few days. Uh, depends on how busy I am. Uh, but uh, there are times when I will post even multiple times a day. And on this group, the, 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 you can go anywhere online and, and find out sort of what's happening in the sky. For example, okay, there's a comet. You probably heard about that. Um, or, you know, Mars is going to be close to this planet. Those are the biggies or the moon is, is in conjunction or close to this planet. Um, you can, th those are easy things that you can sort of find anywhere, but a lot of the stuff that I post on this, uh, on this uh, Facebook group is, uh, 
a little bit more detailed than that. So things like novae and supernovae and sometimes asteroids when they're in conjunction with uh, a galaxy, for example. Um, so things that you wouldn't really see online because people don't really pick up on, on those things and, and feel that they want to share those with the rest of the world. Uh, so you could see here's an example of one I posted six days ago about a new supernova that was magnitude 12.2. 12.2 might not mean much to you right now, but that 12.2 is basically a brightness that in most mid-sized uh, backyard telescopes, you could actually see that uh, supernova. And uh, not only do I kind of post that this is available, but I also tell you how to find it. So, and a lot of objects that you would look for like supernovae or asteroids and things like that, uh, sometimes even using a detailed star chart might not be enough. You might actually need to create a custom chart. And so uh, there's a website called uh, the AAVSO, uh, American Association of Variable Observers, uh, aavso.org. And there's a tool that they have called the Variable Star Plotter. And I, I find this uh, very useful in actually narrowing in on my target. Uh, most people don't use this website for actually that purpose, but I, I actually do. And I think it's uh, quite useful. Um, so I'll talk a, a bit more about that later. But you can really see that this website, uh, or not, it's not really a website, but the Facebook group is actually a wealth of uh, information. So even if you're not a, a Facebook fan or don't even have a Facebook account. I think it's worth it just to create a sort of dummy one or fake one just so that you can, you know, access it. So that's uh, all I'm going to say about that. All right. So, so all you have to do to actually find that Facebook group is just uh, once you go to Facebook or even just in Google, just type in Whistler Astronomy Club and it will uh, come up very easily. Okay, so your mission, if you choose to accept it, this talk is really about observational astronomy and how to become good at observational astronomy. Uh, and so one of your first missions in observational astronomy is to learn the sky. So that would include things like learning sky movement. So how does the sky appear to move throughout the course of the night, throughout the course of the week, month, year, and so forth, uh, as well as things like how does the moon move in relation to the stars? How do the planets move? Uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, as well as learning the constellations. Learning the constellations is key. You know, uh, being in RASC, um, there's people... Uh, who, even my colleagues who have been in astronomy for 20 years, and even some of them can't point out all the constellations that are visible from their latitude. Uh, but it's really important to start out with learning the constellations for a couple of different reasons. One is it's kind of your what I call your passion litmus test, which is basically, are you really interested in astronomy? Because if you're not willing to really put in the effort to learn the constellations, you're probably not going to you know, it might not make sense to go out and buy an expensive telescope, for example, right? Especially if you're going to buy a telescope that is a manual telescope, in other words, one that you can't just hit a button and go to an object, you really have to learn the constellations because if you're looking for an object in a particular constellation, well, you need to know where to point your telescope in the sky, don't you? Uh, and so a lot of the time, it takes a lot of effort to learn the constellations. Why? A couple of reasons. One, the weather, right? that gets on, it gets in the way a lot of the time. It takes a lot of effort, yeah, it, a lot of persistence because sometimes, uh, not sometimes, all of the time, the constellations are in different positions in the sky, different times of the year. They look differently. Sometimes they're on their side, sometimes they're uh, almost upside down. And, and so that gets very challenging, but I'm gonna provide you with a lot of resources and tools and strategies on how to actually learn those constellations. So that is definitely mission number one is to learn the constellations and um, be able to then learn the different types of objects that are within those constellations. This is a, a pretty funny thing, actually. Um, this is called a dung beetle. And a dung beetle, actually, there, there were studies done where they actually studied the path that a dung beetle takes uh, at nighttime. And actually, the dung beetle does navigate using the starry sky, using the stars and the Milky Way. Proof? Well, look at picture A. Picture A shows the dung beetle's path when the sky is visible. And when it is completely cloudy, look at the difference in the path that the dung beetle actually takes. So, Quick question. 
those sure. are different dung beetles or like same, that... probably the same dung beetle okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> what, what... asking me important questions <laughs> yeah so so the way i say it is it, to people in observation astronomy i'm like if the dung beetle can navigate their way around the sky surely humans certainly can and that <laughs> that comes into my next slide which is basically the fact that you know we've been using the starry sky to navigate um on land, on sea for thousands and thousands of years. We use it to plant crops and all sorts of different reasons. So you can actually find it if you understand a lot about just a few key things about uh, celestial navigation, like even how the sky appears to move, which I'm gonna be talking about later this evening. If you understand these things, it could actually ultimately save your life if you got lost. Uh, not just knowing where north is, but beyond that even you can even tell the time if i'm not sure if you know this but actually the big dipper is actually considered a clock there's a way to actually tell the time pretty much the exact time using the position and the movement of the big dipper uh, and so um that's quite Im important so when you start out star hopping or you start out with observational astronomy uh star hopping a lot of the time people think about oh well, that's that complicated thing that really experienced astronomers do with their telescopes and all these detailed star charts you know the geek with the glasses kind of thing but actually star hopping naked eye star hopping which i call um is actually will help you learn the different constellations so a simple example of how to naked eye star hop is just using the big dipper to find the Little Dipper. A lot of the people uh, people can recognize the Big Dipper, but maybe only half of those people recognize the Small Dipper uh, as well. But you can actually use the stars, uh, pointer stars in the Big Dipper to actually find the Little Dipper. And there are many other examples, which you'll see uh, on this slide. So if you want to find the uh, brightest star in the northern hemisphere called Sirius in the constellation Canis Major, the big dog, you can actually use the three stars because more people know about Orion than they do about Canis Major. So you can actually just draw a straight uh, diagonal line down from the three stars in the belt, assuming that Canis Major is high enough uh, above the horizon. And there you go. You've now used one constellation and naked eye star hopping to find another constellation. And then from there, you can just look to the right and see another constellation, Lepus, the uh, rabbit or the hare underneath Orion. And what's interesting is a lot of these constellations that are near each other also have mythological stories about them as well. I'll talk a bit more about that later as well. That's another strategy to actually learn the constellations is to under, if, especially if you're a history buff, is to actually learn the mythology behind them. Because like I said, a lot of those, those mythological stories, the constellations that are actually near each other. Uh, another example would be uh, using the last star in the Big Dipper to find the constellation Bootes uh, and, and a bright star called Arcturus. And that's why you have the term Arc to Arcturus, Arc from the last star in the Big Dipper to Arcturus. Uh, now, the thing is, though, you have to be conscious of sky movement because not every time that you see the Big Dipper are you going to necessarily see Bootes. It may not have risen yet. Right, it depends on its position, but you're going to learn all about that uh, later on uh, this evening. Now, here's the other thing: a lot of people don't realize this, but not only can you use naked eye star hopping to find uh, the brightest stars and constellations, as well as to learn the constellations, but you can also use naked eye star hopping to star hop to deep sky objects, even galaxies that you can see with your naked eye. The brightest one uh, in the Northern Hemisphere being the Andromeda Galaxy. So this uh, image actually shows two ways to use your own eyes to star hop to that galaxy. Uh, you can use the a square of Pegasus uh, and follow a line up from the constellation Andromeda, which is attached to Pegasus, or you can use the W-shaped uh, constellation Cassiopeia, which you see in the upper uh, left-hand corner. And uh, from a star there, you can actually move your way down to the Andromeda galaxy. So 
even naked eye star hopping, you can actually find deep sky objects. And the same would apply to using binoculars and that sort of thing as well. Now, again, you have to keep in mind that this will change depending on the course of the night. And that's why a lot of people don't realize uh, that star charts, um, you actually have to hold them a certain way depending on what time of night it is. And a lot of people actually uh, don't realize that and even some books won't even you buy a sky atlas and it doesn't even tell you the most obvious fact which is hey pay attention to how the sky looks because that's going to determine how you actually hold the atlas i honestly i've been out there before where people are trying to find constellations and they're looking at the atlas like they were reading a book and they're not finding anything because of that and then you get into of course uh what you probably think of when you think of star hopping which is uh star hopping using binoculars or your telescope eyepiece. Uh, the circles that you see here are what are called field of view circles and they basically represent what you would see looking through your eyepiece um, and look, comparing that with the star chart that you're using. And so we're going to be talking about that as well. But in order to practice uh, star hopping using a telescope or a pair of binoculars, if you've done it naked eye, it's really a good prerequisite and, and practice for that. OK, so I mentioned that it's really critical to learn the constellations. I created this uh, when I uh, took a bit of a hiatus from astronomy um, and where it was involved with other passions. But when I got back into astronomy, I wanted a way to learn the constellations uh, quickly and effectively. And this is what's called the constellation matrix. I can't tell you how many thousands, actually probably tens of thousands at this point of these that I've given out through seminars, webinars, presentations, and courses, and all that kind of thing. Um, this is a very powerful tool for a couple of different reasons. I'll point out the, the biggest reason first off and that is because a lot of the time when people get into astronomy if you want to learn the constellations you need a strategy because certain constellations are only visible certain times of the year and certain times of night and actually a lot of books and magazines you'll see they have that what's in the sky tonight um, and uh, what, what the problem with that is it's a it's quite misleading because if you look in your astronomy magazine and it says okay this is what's in the sky tonight and let's say it's January well what people don't realize is that half the constellations are actually missing because they only assume that people are going to go out after dinner and view for maybe an hour or two or maybe up until 10 o'clock at night but in the winter time it's literally dark pitch dark for almost 12 hours and like I said, a lot of the constellations, about half of them are missing from those diagrams. So, it, so if you were to try to learn the constellations by only referring to those sort of circular guides of what's in the sky this month, it's going to take you a long time. So I wanted a strategy. I said, no, I, I know that in the dead of winter, if I'm up early enough or stay up late enough, however you want to look at it, I can actually see many of the spring constellations in the dead of winter. And what's even more than that, yes, even in the dead of winter, but just before it starts to get dusk or light out, I can even see a few of the sum, what we classify as the summer constellations. So again, if you're, if you accept the mission to learn the constellations, this matrix is good for that because it doesn't, it, it tells the truth. It doesn't mislead. And it also helps you understand about uh, celestial movement as well, because remember, just a little key point here, let's say that the sun wasn't visible for an entire day. How long would it take you to view all of the constellations? Well, the answer is a simple 24 hours. That's true. In 24 hours, if we didn't have that pesky sun out there, you would literally see all the constellations that are visible in your hemisphere from your location within a simple 24 hour period. That's fascinating if you actually think about it. And it also tells you, of course, that knowing that means that even with the sun, you don't have to wait a full year to see all of the constellations. So let me talk about how this matrix is organized. And I, this is posted in the drive that I'll be sending you the link to. Um, and I also, what I've done for you, because I recognize that not everybody is from Vancouver. Uh, there's probably more people not from Vancouver on here than there are. Uh, so what I've done is I've given you the Excel template uh, in that drive as well so that you can create your own. 
Now you might be saying, well, how do I create my own? Well, I'll show you that a bit later. That's using a program called Stellarium, which is a free program. And all I did to create this matrix is I literally went in and went into Stellarium. And every day I looked at how the constellations function throughout that day and then plotted them throughout the, the month. So how it's organized is basically I list all of the constellations in alphabetical order with their official abbreviations in brackets. I then tell you each month which you know, whether that constellation is visible or not. But it's more than that. It's not just is that constellation visible that month, it's when is it visible? Is it visible in the evening? So you'll see there's a legend at the top, E for evening, A for all night, and M for morning. This is a powerful tool as well, because if you use this matrix, you can go out there. And if you see that a constellation is only visible in the evening, well, guess what? You probably want to look for those first before the others, because if you try to go just alphabetically, by the time you actually get to one constellation, it will have already set in the West uh, already at that point. So again, I designed this matrix to help you get your biggest bang for your buck, uh, as the sort of saying goes. Um, also, if you see a constellation or a, with brackets, it says P, that means that constellation is only partially visible from our location. So a constellation like Scorpius uh, wouldn't matter where you are in Canada, it's only visible, partially visible from our hemisphere. If you want to see the whole constellation of Scorpius, you'd have to go further south to, let's say, Mexico, right? The other thing it tells you is you'll notice there's an asterisk symbol next to some of these abbreviations. And that's key as well, because that asterisk symbol tells you that that constellation, even though it's visible during that time of night, it's very low on the horizon, which means that if you have mountains like you do in the in BC, you might not actually see that constellation when it shows the asterisk, unless you're uh, somewhere uh, on in the prairies, for example, um, that wouldn't really apply, <laughs> right? Because you can pretty much see it all the way down to the horizon. But it also is good for uh, astrophotographers because astro you don't want to, if you're trying to image a galaxy, you don't want to image it uh, when it's right at the horizon because it's, it's going to not look very good, right? And if you want to view it, in some cases, you're not even going to see that object if it's very low on the horizon. The other thing that this matrix does is it tells you, um, if you look at the uh, row totals, it basically tells you which constellation, how many um, months out of the year are those constellations visible for your location. So if you look at a constellation uh, like Corp uh, Capricornus, that constellation from my location is only visible about six months out of the year. So that means that if I'm, if my goal is to learn all the constellations throughout the year, I need to make sure that I get out during that time of the year and actually view that constellation. Otherwise, a whole year could pass and I might not ha have actually seen Cap Capricornus, right? Uh, you won't see it on this slide, but if you actually look at the full version, you'll also see there are uh, row, uh, column totals as well. And those column totals just basically tell you how many constellations that are visible from your hemisphere are actually visible during that month for you. And so obviously in the winter time, you can get up to, for Vancouver, it's like 56 or 57 constellations. You get to a month like June because of the lackness or lack of darkness, there's only like maybe say 23 or maybe a bit more than that. So use this tool to actually help you learn the constellation. This is good to put a, this on your fridge with a magnet and uh, it will, I guarantee you, because I've done this with my students, if you use this matrix, you will learn the constellations 10 times faster than anybody else using any other strategy. Um, all right, so the one thing that that matrix doesn't have though, are pictures uh, of the constellation. So you kind of need another tool too, right? And that's called a sky atlas. This is just one example. I certainly didn't write this book, so I'm not going to say it's the best or you should buy this one, but it is definitely a good one. Uh, it's funny how they use the word pocket sky atlas because the standard version, the bottom one, the blue one is pocket sky atlas, but it's uh, almost an eight and a half by 11. You certainly wouldn't fit it in your pocket. And then they came up with a jumbo version for, I guess, people who have trouble seeing and that's even larger, right? I think that's like 11 by 17 or something like that. So um, funny that it's called pocket sky atlas, but it certainly is an effective tool. It will help you learn the constellations. And also it is good because it tell, it's very clearly shows you what 
steep, deep sky objects are within those constellations. Because your first mission, of course, is to learn the constellations, be able to identify them in the sky. And then, of course, what you want to do is then learn, OK, well, what are the deep sky objects that are our are, are wow factor that I really want to look at within those constellations? Well, this the, these types of sky atlases will help you with that. For star hopping, not the best, all right, because they this, the magnitude, I think, of this atlas, I think, only goes to magnitude, I think, is it seven, maybe, which is kind of like naked eye. Um, but if you're using a telescope and your telescope goes up to magnitude 13 or 14, probably going to have a bit of a problem star hopping uh, using this uh, atlas because you're going to see a ton more stars in your eyepiece than you see in the atlas. And the opposite of, is true as well uh, in areas where you might have a ton of star, uh, you might have not see very many stars. So in the book, you might not see anything in the book. So you've got nothing to star hop with, but you look in your telescope and there's lots of different stars that you could actually star hop with, right? So uh, I'm gonna be providing you links, by the way, to some free, star, uh, some free charts that were available online. Luckily I downloaded them before they were taken away because the person that had posted them they were at a university and then they left the university and I guess the account got deleted. So uh, they're called triatlas charts and uh, they are one of the best uh, in my opinion for star hopping. There's actually three types. There's one called A set, B set and C set. Uh, the A set is good for naked eye viewing, very similar to the pocket sky atlas. The B set is good for binoculars, easy to remember. And then the C set is a good scale for eyepieces, right? So I'm gonna provide you links to all those charts uh, at some point which here's an example. So uh, the, first, the chart that you see on the left-hand side, uh, that is an, a, uh, an example of an A-set chart. And then the example you see of the constellation Lyra uh, on the right-hand side, that is uh, a, I think that's a B-set chart. I don't have an example of a C-set chart, but uh, you'll see them when I, I send you the links. Okay, so for observational observing- Is it okay? If, Somebody just asked sure. a question in the chat about huh? about apps um you did mention apps there as well and they were asking um uh like it, it's they ask any idea how accurately does an app like sky map work for locating these objects um and, and i guess i would also follow up like are there particular apps that you would use um and how would you use them when you're when you're actually out there because um you know if you're looking at a bright screen and then you're looking at the sky your eyeballs aren't gonna adjust that well. Definitely. That, that's a good point. A, a few comments. Definitely the last comment that you made is an important one. You want to preserve your night vision as much as possible and having your screen on is, is not a good way to do that. Now, some of these apps have a what they call the ready illuminated feature, but the problem is that you don't have that on your phone. So you're going to turn your phone on, you're going to blind yourself before you can get into the app and actually turn that feature on, right? So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is in the, I don't know about you, but uh, where I live in the winter, it's really cold. And a lot of times, if it's like minus 10, your phone is going to die in like 10 minutes. So there's no point. Uh, if you, you're in Edmonton and it's like minus 30, turn your phone on and like almost immediately it's dead. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's very limited in that regard. The other thing as well about these apps, a lot of beginners, they don't realize that they have to set it up properly. You have to go into the settings and set your location. Otherwise, I see people, I've seen this before at, at star parties and things like that. They're pointing their, their app at the sky and it thinks they're in like uh, the UK or Mexico or somewhere, right? Um, so that becomes a problem. The other thing is you don't want to become dependent on it uh, as well um, because um, the thing is that when you look at those apps, the stars are connected by lines. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but when I look up at the sky, unless I've been knocked in the head, um, I don't see lines connecting the stars in a constellation. So the same goes with sky atlases as well as apps. They they have lines connecting. And so that is good maybe for a beginner, but once you get a bit more experience, you can use a program like Stellarium. And maybe some of these apps have the ability to do this as well, which is you can turn off the constellation lines. And so that will uh, help you as well. So, but yeah, I could have a whole discussion on, on apps and I do have a little bit of it in my, in my presentation, but definitely use whatever tools that you can to learn this guy. I would prefer though a paper uh, sky atlas with a red, uh, LED headlamp uh, over an app, though, uh, any day for sure. 
Yeah, I think the battery point is especially yeah. uh, important up here in Canada. I, I've been out many a time, you know, especially when you're camping. It's like you don't want to bring out the phone and a book doesn't die. That's so. right. Exactly. And you might need, depending on where you are, you might need that. <laughs> you, yeah. Some of the places I've observed, I had coyotes behind me. I had bears walking up behind me. So you might need that phone at some point. You don't want yeah. to kill it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Excellent. Okay. So weather is definitely a, a key factor in observing. And uh, there are lots of apps out there. Um, there's no perfect one. I mean, everyone knows the weather forecasting is, is not perfect. It's a, it, it's a good science, but it's uh, not perfect. However, I did discover this app many years ago, and I prefer it over any other app. And why I say that is because I have experience using it at I think for about two or three years, I literally compared this app every single day to another app, which I'm going to talk about in a second, as well as by just looking out the window. And uh, I found this app to be extremely accurate. It's called Clear Outside, and it's available for PC, for Mac. It's available uh, uh, on for your Android phone, for your iPhone, and, and so forth. So uh, definitely can highly consider using uh, this app. The nice thing as well that this app does that some other apps don't tell you is that they tell you what the cloud level is, low, medium, and high. And why that's important is in places, is especially when I lived in Whistler, I could get to a high point. So the cloud level at low might be like 100 or 90%. Medium might be same thing, 100, 90%. And then high cloud, zero. So what does that mean? Well, that means that I might be able to actually get high enough that I can get above the cloud level and actually have a clear sky. I use this as well for hiking, for uh, I do a lot of photography of, uh, and when I see low cloud 100 and medium cloud 100, and then I see high cloud zero, I'm booting it up there um, to, to actually get above there so I can get that beautiful sea of clouds that you see. So uh, this app is good for that as well. And you don't get that with other apps. I mean, you don't even get this with many other forecasts either. So here's the app. I need to hear as someone from Ontario who can't go up mountains to observe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah. now, this app I'm gonna poo poo on a little bit. Um, and you probably don't want me to because it's kind of been the astronomer's app uh, for many years. And if you look in, in typical astronomy textbooks, if you look in Terrence Dickinson's book, he'll have it. But I'm telling you, for three years straight, I compared this app to the reality. I compared this app to the other app. And this app was off so much. It's not funny. Uh, it's The problem with this app is it's highly, highly overly optimistic <laughs> is, is what I have from, from the experience. And I don't know where they get their data from but I find it not to be the best. Now, I'm not saying I don't look at it. I certainly look at it, but I wouldn't pack up the car and drive three hours based on this forecast. That's all I would, I would say about, about that. And again, the cloud cover is just that. It doesn't tell you low, medium, high, or anything like that. So take it with a grain of salt. But this is a very good app for those of you who live near metropolitan areas and it's called the light pollution map and it's very effective because you might not be able to drive two or three hours to get outside of darkness but what this app does is it allows you to find these little pockets of darkness that might be near your area that are quite light polluted so i'll give you an example i'll just uh boot up this website here And we'll look at uh, we'll look at a place like Dartmouth. I think somebody was from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. That's near my hometown where I, I grew up. So uh, that's a good example because Dartmouth is a metropolitan area. But I know for a fact that you may not have to get out too far to actually get into darkness. There we go. So there we go, looks pretty horrible, right? Um, at the center, but you can see obviously red is bad, white is the worst, orange is pretty bad, yellow is so-so, green is getting much better, and then you get to the point where there's no color and it, it's complete darkness. But you could see that uh, if you look here around this red area, there's this area here, 
Bedford Basin. Um, so you might be able to go somewhere here on the shore and get a little bit away from that or over here uh, by Cory Lake, for example. See how that surrounded, this area is surrounded by orange and bright yellow, but actually if you can get into this area, there might be a logging road or somewhere like that where you can drive a bit in and get into some darkness. So that's why this app is really uh, good for that. And the other thing is at face value, it basically tells you, gives you a realistic view of how far am I gonna have to really drive to actually get 100% you know, complete darkness, right? So uh, this, um, I have this link, in, I'm gonna send you a document or in that drive that I have, which I'm gonna send you a link to, th there is this link here. So I won't bother pasting this in the text chat now because all those links, I have a guide that I created that's got a, about a hundred or so different links and it's all organized by different categories, which I think you'll appreciate. Okay, so some other things to keep in mind as an observational astronomer. It's very important to protect your night vision. It actually takes many hours for your eyes to adjust. It actually takes a good 45 minutes to an hour to adjust, but actually it could even take days. And that's why uh, in, the, in the past, in history, observational astronomers that worked in observatories, they would actually sometimes actually put patches over their eyes for a day or two before they would actually observe because e even incremental changes actually happen over days. Well, you know that, right? You, you hear the stories about somebody who was, you know, stuck uh, underneath ground or something like that for many years, and then they end up coming out and, and you know, it, it makes a difference. So it can actually take several hours. And the thing is, it's easy to lose. So here's a good tip for you. You know, when you open your car door and the light goes on, turn that feature off. So, because if you're going to drive on a, on a dark road for two, three hours, you get to your observing site, what's the point of turning the car, bright car lights on? All the night vision that you just got during that drive, you've just blown away and now you've got to spend 45 minutes getting it back, right? So these are just little things to keep in mind. Um, there are a few tools out there. There are headlamps that uh, you can use call, that have red LEDs or green LEDs. Um, I've read different articles about which one's more effective. Um, and actually the, there's even one article I read recently that even said there's no proof that actually white light is any worse off than red or green. The difference though is with red or green, a lot of the time it's much dimmer. It can only go so bright. If, but if you had a white light and it was dim enough, you wouldn't be that bad off either. Um, so something to keep in, in mind uh, is that uh, it takes time for you to adjust to the darkness. So that time that you're setting up your telescope, you know, if you get there shortly after sunset, protect that night vision as much as you can. And here's another thing that kind of proves that it that you can that your eyes adjust over a period of time. Sometimes people will tell me, oh, I was out in this place um, and it was so dark, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And I'm like, well, that's interesting because <laughs> there's no such thing as darkness. That's that dark. That's an exaggeration. Or the other thing is, it just means your eyes have not adjusted to the dark. I've been out at night on a completely dark night for eight to 10 hours. And I can tell you one thing that after six hours, I can certainly see my hand in front of my face. And I'm in an area where it's the darkest on the scale that can be. I can almost read my Sky Atlas chart pages without even a headlamp at that point. So when somebody tells you it was so dark, they couldn't see your hand in front of your face, just tell them, well, that means you actually didn't adjust your eyes to the darkness long enough. <laughs> All right. I have a very important question. That sure. is, uh, at least how I observe. Can your eyes adjust to the darkness while you sleep? I would think so. Okay. <laughs> I, good I certainly wouldn't see why not. Like you could, you could go and you could set up your telescope. You could align it and you can go and sleep for four hours and then wake up and not see any lights. Just set a regular alarm, not on your phone. Don't have the <laughs> light turn on, sneak outside and you should be able to see lots of stuff. Definitely. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> good question. All right, another key tool for the observational astronomy in regards to vision is uh, something called averted vision. And pilots actually have to use this as well at nighttime when they're flying. And averted vision uh, 
is really important for beginners in observational astronomy. It can really make the difference between seeing an object and not seeing an object. So a lot of the time, if you're at a star party and you're looking at a faint object, you go up to the telescope, uh, somebody says, oh, look in the eyepiece and see this. I'm not seeing anything. You, oh, you don't see the galaxy there? It's because they're not using averted vision. Averted vision basically just means utilizing the proper cones and rods in your eyes uh, appropriately. And so what it means is not to look directly at the object, but if you look a bit away or up to the right or down to the left, you the object may come into view. And it's a little bit different for everybody. Everybody has a different sweet spot. And actually, some eyes are different than the other. For me, I discovered this uh, a few years ago that for what are known as planetary nebula or nebulae, one eye for me is substantially better than the other eye for viewing those objects. And it, it, it may have something to do with the, the light wavelengths or whatever the spectrum, uh, but it is noticeably different for me uh, for viewing planetary nebula from one eye to the other. Yeah. So play around you, with your vision. Yes. Um, you've got a little bit here and I just wanted you to maybe mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about it, like the difference between cones and rods. Um, and so, yeah, sorry. well, the rods uh, are more on the edges of the eyeball. So that the rods are actually what helps you see at nighttime, right? It's the cones that help you during the daytime. So you want to make use of the rods. Uh, and the rods, again, are on the edges. So by using your averted vision, uh, you're making more use of those rods and, and firing those rods more <laughs> than the cones. And the rods are what you actually need at nighttime to, to see those. And I can't remember exactly. So you have to let me know. Are rods the ones that they detect light, whereas cones detect color, or is that? I believe uh, it may be, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. I, it, it might be a combination of both. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'm if anybody a, knows in the chat, they can yeah, note it there too. Yeah. But sorry to interrupt. No worries at all. Here is a guide that I also put together. I do this usually every November when it's pouring rain and I take the time because it takes quite a few, it takes about 12, 24 hours to actually create these. And I do it usually over two days, 12 hours a day. And basically I create, it tells me, and I, I've given this to you from July to December. There was no point in giving it to you from December to, or from, yeah, from January to, to June. But um, what this does is it shows you every single day of the year uh, when sunset is, when twilight ends, when twilight begins, uh, when sunrise is, when moonrise is, when moon, moonset is, how many hours of darkness are there actually, this is astronomical darkness, official darkness during that night. And actually this is the, the one for tonight. So if you look tonight, technically there's only an hour and a half of absolute darkness. Well, that's good actually, because for the last month or so, there was zero hours and minutes and seconds of absolute darkness. So we actually have an hour and a half tonight between, at least in my location, between 12, 19 a.m. and 1.49 a.m. in the morning. But you can see that starts to increase over time. By the time we get to uh, Saturday, July 25th, we've actually got two hours and 46 minutes of absolute darkness. It also tells you what the moon percentage is and the prime time. The prime time basically means, the prime time is, when you have astronomical darkness, plus there's no moon present. So the moon is either a new moon or it's below the horizon. Uh, and so that's important for observational astronomers who really uh, appreciate very dark sky observing. So I created this for my location. For you, your location, it probably won't be too different. It might be different by 10 minutes or something like that, but probably not a, a whole lot different. Uh, so that is in the drive that um, I will be sending you the link to. And actually, let me do that now, just so I don't uh, forget. So let me do that. Do you want me to, so I probably won't put this up on YouTube because then it just a, it's a open for a ton of people to access it. Um, uh, and for very, anyway, so do you want me to put this up? Is it okay if I put this up on our website? Sure, yeah. So you don't okay. want me to paste this in text chat right now? Into the, into the chat, 100%. Anyone's okay. here, here on Zoom, go for it. Um, just okay. for those who are watching on YouTube, I'm just going to put it up on our website so there's an extra step to, uh, to get to it so that we don't end up with any issues um, from folks watching later or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Is that okay with you, Robert? Yep, perfect. Definitely. Okay, so let me let me do that. 
So it looks like you're using the Q and A. Oh, um, if you, yeah. Oh, there we go. I got it. There we go. Okay. All right. So that is the link to the drive that I have a lot of these different uh, resources. All right. The other thing to uh, keep in mind, so this is an example talking about uh, twilight and so forth, is understanding uh, what's known as civil nautical and astronomical twilight. So it's basically a progression. So you have for this is for tonight for Vancouver. So sunset is actually at 9:11 p.m. Uh, then uh, so when does civil twilight end? So that means that it's starting to get dark, of course, from 9-11 until uh, 9.52. So civil twilight ends at 9.52, but it's still light from 9.52 to 10.47 p.m. That's known as nautical uh, darkness. And then between 10.47 p.m. and 12.14 a.m., yes, it is actually still light out. Uh, that's called uh, astronomical darkness. But after 1214 AM, that's when you get uh, what's called absolute darkness. Or if you look at the diagram, it's called night. And then, but that doesn't last this time of year very long. Because if you look now tomorrow, sunrise is at 526 AM. But here's the thing, astronomical twilight, twilight begins at 227 AM. So that's why we have that darkness from 1214 AM to 227 AM, right? And then it's still dark, of course, from 227 AM to 350 AM. So, but not as dark, obviously. And then once you get to 447 AM, uh, past that point, it's pretty much completely light out. So this can help you with planning and you can find this information um, on this website here called date and uh, timeanddate.com. So that's another valuable resource for you as well. And you can enter any location on earth that you want for this. All right, so from an observational point of view, it's also important to understand the moon phases. Uh, and so what a new moon looks like. So after, you, know, you should be able to look up at the sky at any point and see what phase the moon is and know instinctively, okay, are we getting closer to a new moon? In other words, the absence of the moon, or are we getting closer to a full moon? And so you can actually, if you kind of implant this picture that you see uh, in the upper right-hand corner here into your mind, you can very easily know, depending on how the moon is illuminated, whether you are getting closer to a new moon or a full moon, which is important to know, right, for planning. I used to take my vacation days based on the phases of the moon and the weather. Um, I did that for years. Um, and then the other thing is that um, if you look at the bottom chart here, this is as well something that's worth kind of implanting in your mind as well, is knowing the moon phase. So during a new moon, the moon rises at sunrise and it sets at sunset. Well, that's perfect, right? Because we don't care about the moon during the daytime, right? We care about the moon if it's visible during the nighttime. First quarter, that moon phase, that means that the moon rises at noon and it sets at midnight. Well, here's the thing. In the wintertime, that's good news because that still means that I have some observing time. When is my observing time going to be? Well, of course, it's going to be in the evening, isn't it? Before midnight. Then if we have a full moon, that's the suckiest part, right? That means that the moon rises at sunset and it sets at sunrise. Well, that's no good because it means it's visible all night. And then the third quarter means it rises at midnight uh, and then it uh, sets at noon. So when is my observing time for that? Well, if the moon rises at midnight, then my observing time is the evening. I think I said earlier for the local noon, it, uh, I mixed that up, but you can see there. So for first quarter, if it rises at noon and it sets at midnight, you can see how that plays into when your observing time is actually going to be. Is it going to be in the evening or is it going to be in the morning time, right? And that's what this diagram here shows you as well. You can use this to kind of plan your observing because you it might be it might be around close to a full moon. But the thing is, especially in the winter time, you still have some opportunity to actually observe a dark sky with the absence of the moon without 
something like this, you might make some assumptions that, oh, it's not a good observing night because it's too close to the full moon, right? So you want to put that out of your mind and deal with the reality of things. Okay, so a few things before I open it up for questions. And this comes into celestial sky movement. So one of your missions, if you remember before, was to learn the constellations. But the other mission is to also learn how the sky appears to move throughout the course of the night as well. And the two kind of go hand in hand. So if you take a look at this image here, the, or images, you could see that this is an astrophotographer that's opened their uh, shutter for a certain period of time, and you get what are known as star trails. So the first picture is an example of the northern part of the sky. And you can see that the stars go around in a circle. In this case, it's a anti-clockwise uh, because we're in the northern hemisphere. Then the second diagram shows you the stars as they pass over the southern hemisphere or over the southern horizon. That's the best time to view the constellations uh, with the exception of it, some of them in the north because the constellations when they pass over the south that means that they cross what's known as the meridian line which means that they're high their highest point uh, in the sky then you can see what the star trails look like in the east as they rise and then as the star trails um, as the constellations and stars set in the west understanding how the sky appears to move in relation to that line called the meridian line, which is an imaginary line that runs north south, uh, is very key. If you've ever been at a star party and you're looking at a planet and then it's your turn to come up to the eyepiece, here's the wonderful thing that I'm going to teach you is instead of having to get the uh, astronomer to find the planet again, what you can do is if you understand sky movement, if you know what side of the meridian line that you're looking at the object on, you can actually move the telescope either up, down, left or right and a combination of those to determine how to put the object back in the center of the eyepiece. Now you might say, well, for a planet, that's no big deal. I just point my finder scope or my red dot finder at it. But what if you're looking at a galaxy that you just spent 10 minutes or 15 minutes star hopping to, and now the object is out of the eyepiece? Are you going to spend another 10 or 15 minutes to find that object? You don't have to. If you understand sky movement, you know exactly how to move your telescope to get that object back in the center of the eyepiece. So if it's on the left of the meridian line, you simply move your telescope. Now, this is for a altitude asthma telescope. It's a bit different for uh, what's known as a, as a equatorial mount telescope. But let's just deal with an altitude asthma telescope. So if it's on the left, you have to obviously move your telescope a little bit to the right and a little bit up. Try this at home and it works, right? And the reason why you have to move it right and to the up is because if it's on the left hand side of the meridian line, that object is still rising in the sky, which means move my telescope up and it's moving to the right because it's in the process of moving from east to west, which has to be right. You see where I'm going with that? And if it's on the left hand side of the meridian line to get the object back in the center of the eyepiece, I still have to move my telescope to the right because it's as long as it's risen in the east, it's always in the progression of moving towards the west. But at this point, I need to move my telescope a little bit down instead of up. Why? Because the object is in the process of setting and the process of setting means it's moving downward in the sky. So isn't that fascinating that you can actually move your, if you understand sky movement, it can actually help you get the object back in the center of the eyepiece. And as I mentioned before, if you spend a lot of time star hopping to an object and it was a challenge, this is a key piece of information for you to be aware of and get experience with. So I think before I open it up to questions, I want to uh, say that a program that I would highly recommend that it's gonna help you with observational astronomy is a program called Stellarium. Uh, the link to it is in the guides that I've sent you. I even created my own guide for Stellarium. It's massive, I'm gonna warn you now. It's like 50 pages or something like that. But here's the thing, it's not just a guide on how to use Stellarium. It's, an, it's, it's for educators. So it will actually help you learn about observational astronomy through different activities and things like that. So highly recommend you download that program called Stellarium uh, and use that guide 
uh, because if you use that guide that I created, it will really open your mind to uh, open your skills to observational astronomy. I'll also mention now that Stellarium is both is free and it's open source and it runs on every platform. Um, so you can download it for free, but bear in mind it is also, I think it's technically in beta, but it's been in beta for, you know, <laughs> its entire life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's nice because it's open source. So people add the, you know, add add-ons every so often, which is uh, really enhances it. All righty. Okay. So I'll, yeah, sorry, Linda, you go ahead. No, I didn't. I, I was just going to say questions. <laughs> we have we've a couple. got a couple. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, I'll just go in the order that they're here. Uh, first question is the monthly dark sky hours chart and constellation matrix for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. It is. OK. Yeah. There you go, Mark. Um, next, for the charts and tables, like the monthly one, is there an automated way of generating those? Or did he, I think you, retype them all? Uh, run that by me one more time. For the charts and tables, like the monthly one, is there an automated way of generating those? Um, uh, no, no, not really. No, you have to put in the work. That's why in the in the link to the drive, my Google Drive that I sent you, I gave you an Excel one so you can kind of do the work. But here's the thing. I'm glad you asked that question <laughs> because the thing is this. It took me a long time to create that. And I had to go in and look in Stellarium and I was learning the constellations as I was creating it. So by the time I actually finished it, I, I, I really didn't even need it. <laughs> so, so that's the thing. It's like why people, why teachers in, in yeah. high school and university let you make a cheat sheet is because you inadvertently yeah. learn it while you, while you make it. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, another question here, suggestion for a beginner telescope. All right. Well, that's a, a good one. So the, th the thing with with that is the any telescope that I would recommend is no telescope. OK, it's a bit of a joke, but I would recommend a pair of binoculars first. And the reason why I say a pair of binoculars is, again, I always say that it's your passion test. Right. If you get a pair of binoculars, you can see a lot of different objects. I'll just tell you that now. You can enjoy the Milky Way, lots of different deep sky objects that you can view, galaxies and all that sort of thing in your binoculars. And a lot of the time, if you get a telescope that's a manual telescope, your binoculars will actually help you. It becomes a complement. You'll actually use the two hand in hand at some point. Um, and again, it's your passion test. If you buy a, pair of, a good pair of astronomical binoculars and you only take them out maybe three times a year, think about it. How many times are you going to really take a telescope out during the year? That's a lot more work to actually carry and set up and do all that kind of thing. But beside that, you might be extremely wealthy and you don't care. So I'll still answer your question. <laughs> so the type of telescope I would recommend uh, is a manual telescope so that you can learn how to star hop. Uh, because it will help you learn the sky and the hobby becomes much more rewarding. I don't have time to actually uh, do this, mm -hmm. but I actually have a whole presentation on, it's called the 14 reasons why you should star hop. And uh, there's a lot of good reasons uh, in there uh, mm -hmm. on why you, you, you'll want to star hop. So definitely a manual telescope. I recommend a Dobsonian telescope, uh, one that you can kind of push around uh, and um, learn the sky basically that's that's the bottom line and that's most of the advice that's just my not my advice that's the advice that you'll get if you go online and find just google it you a lot of people will say the same sort of thing and my, like so as far as binoculars go like my parents i keep saying it's my uncles i found in my grandparents basement and they're from like some uh like a zoo like they're zoo oh, binoculars right. and they're great like you know they do what they're supposed to do they make the pleiades bigger um so it's it, it's you don't have to necessarily go and spend thousands of dollars just from the start. Exactly. Um, and so that the way you answered that also answers this other question here. So if you're a beginner, it's best to start observing with the naked eye and then maybe proceed to binoculars before investing in a telescope question. Um, so thank you. Uh, next can I, one. Can I throw out another option as well quickly? Mm -hmm. um, the other one, I, does Vancouver have a telescope loan program? They do. As soon as you said, as soon as you said, can I throw something else out? I knew you were going to actually say that's funny. I read your <laughs> mind. But yeah, yeah. Vancouver does have a telescope program. So if you're a RASC member, you can actually borrow a telescope. Uh, and they have these Dobsonian telescopes that I'm talking about. They have uh, many of those uh, that you can borrow. That's cool. 
so but I'm not in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of I'll, I'll answer that one, Alundria. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of RASC centers do have telescope loan programs. Uh, Toronto, Mississauga both have them. A lot of them all over the country do. So uh, it's one of the best, I, in my opinion, perks of membership is that you don't have to decide to buy a giant expensive telescope. You can go try one for, for just, just for having a RASC membership. Um, so I'm going to shamelessly plug our memberships. <laughs> then you can co go and borrow telescopes. Okay. When my renewal's up, you'll have to tell me which center to join then because <laughs> I'm a national member. Um, oh, you can't borrow any telescopes then. Okay. I can't. Um, I just posted the links, by the way, to all those uh, triatlas charts that I was talking about. Um, and uh, I also included, for the CSET charts, I included uh, a mirror image set. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but some telescopes, especially refractor telescopes, have what's called an erecting prism. And what that does is creates a horizontal flip. And that horizontal flip, there's no way that you can hold the chart page to compensate for that, other, other than turning the page upside down and shining a flashlight through, which completely defeats the purpose. So what I've done is I've taken these into software and I've actually done this for you. I've taken all 570 pages and I've basically rotated them in a way that if you have that type of telescope that that you can make use of those charts. Uh, that's my biggest beef and pet peeve with telescope companies is that they there is a uh, it's called a um, I think it's the erecting prism. It's the star diagonal. It's the star diagonal that causes mm -hmm. that that horizontal, that mirror flip, the mirror image. Uh, but you can get an erecting prism that will correct that. But telescope companies don't sell that with the telescope. They just sell the erecting prism. And the pro, which really um, bugs me because they're, they're selling a telescope um, with an accessory that you can't use really with any star chart uh, because Again, it, you, to do the mental flip in your head is extremely difficult for beginners. So anyways, I've uh, fixed that all for you by giving you those uh, charts with the proper orientation. It did cut off, it cut off your text after the B set link. Could you send the C set links again? Please? Oh yeah, for okay. sure. I, that is like my biggest problem I have with my telescope. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> all right, let's do that. Perfect, thank you. Okay. There you go. Thanks. Great. Perfect. Um, there's another question here from Cynthia. Would you please describe how the summer triangle moves across the night sky? All right. Well, the easiest thing for that, yeah, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yep. You sure are. Okay. All right. So the easiest way to do that is to actually use a program like Stellarium to actually view that. So let's uh, go to nighttime. So what are the stars that make up the summer triangle. Well, we have uh, the constellation, three constellations. There's the constellation Lyra, there's the constellation Cygnus, and there's uh, the constellation um, um, Cygnus. Did I, did I just said Alpha three. Nope. Uh, Aquila. Aquila, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The eagle, Aquila yeah. the eagle. So if we just simply Google any one of these, There is Altair, which is one of the stars in Aquila. We have up here, we have Vega, which is the other star that makes up that triangle in Lyra and then Deneb in Cygnus. So there's the triangle. So if you take a look, if we back it up here to, you can start to see it, let's say at around 10 o'clock. So there it is. And if we zoom out a bit here, you can see at that point, it's pretty much in the Southeast. And so if we advance the time, if we just go, I'll just go by minute, but I'll go quickly. You can kind of see what's happening here. So it's moving across the sky. And of course, remember the constellations rise in the east. They travel across the south, right? At which point they reach their highest point and then they set in the west. So if we advance now here by a few hours, you can see that now those three constellations are past the meridian line and they're in the process of actually setting. And uh, because the night is so short, uh, you don't really get to see that, you know, you don't get to see it from rising to transiting across the south and into the west. You really, for the most part, get to see it when it's uh, going from southeast to south. And by that point, once it reaches uh, the meridian line, it's uh, light out.
So that's how you can use a program like Stellarium to uh, answer those types of questions. Perfect, thank you. Um, there's another question here. Does Robert have suggestions between a um, eight by 42 set of binoculars versus full 10 by 50s? Eight by 42 and 10 by 50s? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the easy way to answer that question, um, just I have an eight by 56 and I have a 20 by 80. Um, oh. how, so the thing is th with binoculars, the bigger they are, so binoculars, there are two numbers involved. The first number, just for those people who might not know this, I think the person that asked the question probably know, but maybe not everyone. So the first number represents the uh, magnification factor. So an eight by 42 means that you're magnifying eight times. The 42 is the diameter of the objective lens in the binocular. So that lens at the end of the binoculars, that's the, the diameter of, of that glass piece. The bigger that glass piece is, the more the light that you can collect, the more that deep sky objects that you can view. The problem is that they become very heavy. And when you mag the more that you magnify, you magnify the Earth's motion. And so that means that even if you're trying to hold them steady, they're going to shake a little bit. Even if you really think you're holding them steady, they're still going to shake. Now, you can get a tripod to fix that problem, of course. Um, so if you want to, my recommendation is if you want to learn the constellations in the night sky, I'd, st I'd go more with the eight by fifties than I would by the uh, 10 by fifties. Uh, so lower magnification for learning the night sky. Once you start to learn the deep sky objects uh, and where they are in the constellations and how to find them, then maybe something like uh, 10 by 50 or a 20, 20 by 80. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have one question in the Q and A here. Um, and I thought this might be just something interesting to bring up. Like we, I, I, we can't, it says last night I saw a star in the Northern sky, maybe Sirius creating a red, blue and white lights in the Northern view. And this person lives in Vancouver. Um, so, I mean, I get these questions a lot and, yeah. and I always direct people to a program like Stellarium. Yeah. Um, yeah. the other thing that I should mention is when you, all stars kind of change their color a bit, uh, mm -hmm. like in the when they're low on the horizon, because of what's called atmospheric turbulence. The classic example is uh, the star Sirius in the mm -hmm. uh, northern hemisphere. It's not visible right now at this time of year, but in the winter time, when it's low on the horizon, you'll see it shimmer, rainbow colors, all sorts of different colors. Mm -hmm. um, um, but if you're looking for an object, I would just recommend going into Stellarium, making a note of what time that you saw the object, and then what direction that you were looking in as well. And if you pull up Stellarium, there's probably a good chance that you're going to find the object that you were looking at, unless it's something that was transitory, like maybe it was a meteor or a, something like that, or it could be a satellite or something. A lot of the time I get people, they don't know what the International Space Station looks like when it goes over, so they think it's something different. So yeah, definitely. Uh, but Stellarium as well will tell you, if you know your location, it will tell you if if the International Space Station was actually passing during that time. So mm -hmm. have a look in Stellarium, use my guide to help you, and you'll probably answer your question pretty quickly. Great. Well, thank you for answering that. Yeah. Um, I have I have a couple or one question from the YouTube chat and also several insights from several astronomers watching over there who think it may be Capella. So if anyone, if mm -hmm. that, and whoever, hold on, who is that? Um, D Runner. If uh, go and check Stellarium and see if you can find Capella. Uh, we have a couple, a couple astronomers suggesting it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two questions from Lou on YouTube. First of all, uh, or actually one of them you answered with the binocular question. Um, as an estimate, how long do you think it took you to put together all the resources in that Google Drive? They were very impressed. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear like them uh, hundreds an hour, probably a couple thousand hours, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I, I, wow. like well, actually, uh, I actually have some charts that I uh, I actually created field of view circles for thousands of objects on on the triatlas charts. I don't think I shared those with you yet. I don't think I've shared them with anybody yet because I'm in the process of writing a book with one of my colleagues from from Rask, and it might be part of that. So I don't want to uh, give that out at this point. But basically, what I've done is I've charted the path. So in star hopping, what you can do is you can 
uh, the, the object behind star hopping is to go from the brightest star in a constellation that's closest to the object that you're looking for, right? So if you are looking to star hop to the Hercules globular cluster, then you find the constellation Hercules, you find the closest star uh, to that um, object, and then you star hop from it. But what I do is I go a step beyond that. I like to get my biggest bang for my buck. So the trialless charts that I shared with you are very detailed. So I don't just star hop, you know, randomly. Um, I will actually, I, there could be different things along the way, like maybe a few double stars or a carbon star, or maybe there's some type of open cluster. So I might choose every time I might choose a different path to view different objects along the way. And that's why, like, if you have a, if you, that's the joy of having a manual telescope. If you have a go-to scope, you don't have a choice because you hit a button and it goes to the object and you can't see anything in the process of it going to the object because it slews too quickly, right? But with a, it's like choose your own adventure books when it comes to star hopping with a manual telescope. Every time you can take a different route to see different objects along the way. So uh, I would highly recommend doing that uh, if, you, if you end up using the triatlas charts. Because those triatlas charts have a ton, millions of like, not thousands, like millions of objects uh, over the 570 pages. And by the way, those 570 pages cover both hemispheres as well. Wow. Well, you sold me. I will definitely be <laughs> doing more star hopping. That's for sure. Um, I think we've covered most of our questions, but I have a, oh, maybe not. Um, I have a final uh, wrapping up question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Two of them. What got you, or how long have you, oh, this, is, this is like three. This is tell me your life story. Um, how, how long have you been into astronomy? What got you interested in it and what's your favorite thing to look at? I, I was involved uh, probably after I graduated from university. I was living in Toronto at the time. So that would have been like, I don't know, 2001 or something like that. I, I belonged to RASC and I tried to observe a little bit. I bought a telescope, but I didn't really know much of the constellations and I didn't, it was just, I would just kind of do what a lot of people do is they buy a telescope and they look at the things that they can actually see with the naked eye, like the planets and the moon. And I tried to, I, I think I, I was able to find the Andromeda galaxy, but after that, I really didn't understand the importance of good star charts. <laughs> and so uh, that's really key. A lot of people don't realize that just uh, the star charts, a good set of star charts is just as important as a telescope. Um, so, so yeah, I did. I stuck with it for a little bit, and then I just moved on. But literally, I basically started coming back into astronomy in probably 2014. So it's been probably about six years now that uh, I've really put the put to the gas on on getting back into astronomy. Um, and uh, it's it's been good. Like a lot of the resources that I created, I I created the different strategies on how to find things. And I've, I've, I was able to, uh, to learn a lot. I was able to teach two courses at SFU uh, without an astronomical background. I've been on TV a few different times for things. I've written articles, I've been in the newspaper. I've, I've helped so many people in astronomy. I've, I've achieved a lot and mostly because my background was in learning and development. So I basically threw everything that I knew about learning and development theory into mastering astronomy. And I was able to do it in probably, I've been doing this like quite a lot for the last six years since 2014, but literally in probably two years, I went from almost nothing to finding black holes with a pair of or sorry, with, with a telescope. <laughs> and actually wow. it's interesting you might say well how can you find a how can you find a black hole with a telescope well you can add, there's a star called uh, Cygnus V404 and uh, you can actually a couple of years ago you, it actually was the first uh, black hole that a backyard astronomers could actually observe because they could observe the effects of the black hole on a nearby star. What would happen is every few seconds, the star would flicker and dim and br brighter. And that was the first time that that actually happened with a star that was bright enough magnitude that you could actually see that change. So literally with your naked eye, second by second or minute by minute, you were looking at the effect of a black hole sucking material in from a star. That, yeah, a lot of people, I'm surprised they didn't get that question. Most people are, what's the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life that was definitely it but um 
but that takes a lot that took a lot of skill to be able to do that to find it like it's it's a it's a difficult star to actually find because it's not very bright and and you have to do some some serious star charting to actually be able to see something <laughs> like that so yeah so you if, cool. you can do the same thing uh, just put your mind to it <laughs> Well, I'm going to go start that process right now because that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, thank you. I think that covers everything. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight and sharing, sharing first of all, your knowledge and then second of all, your resources, resources with us. That, as noted by Bruce, that's very generous of you to share that with us. Um, all of the time and the effort and the hours you put into creating that is phenomenal and they are fantastic teaching resources. So thank you so much for uh, for sharing with that with us. We really well, thanks for having me and feel free to, to tap my resources anytime. I've, the last six years have been focused on Vancouver, but uh, I'm part of RASC, so the national can use me at any point for, for anything. Careful, I make drag you yeah. kicking and screaming back into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everything. And thanks everyone mm -hmm. for joining uh, from all over Canada. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, this video will be up on YouTube or it's up on YouTube right now. And if I haven't sent that link, I will do that right now. Um, so if you need to go back and watch anything, uh, you can and rewatch anything. Uh, the links will all be up that Robert has provided will be all up on uh, the speaker series page on our website. Um, and I'll likely put them up on the Explore the Universe page too. If, in case there's anyone here who's looking to try out observing, um, we're also running an online observing course uh, on every other Thursday. The next one is next week, a week today. Um, so it'll be up on that page as well, because this is something that I think would be very useful for, for the folks completing that course. Um, and I think that just about covers everything that I wanna talk about. Thank you so much, Alundria, for being here as well. Alundria uh, is with us from Sky News. Thanks, and Jenna. Thank you, Robert. This has been wonderful. Um, I, I've seen a lot of comments here about, you know, people who are, you know, awesome answer. You're very generous yes. for your information. So thank you. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And feel free to reach out to me at any point uh, for more, more questions. If you join the uh, Astronomy, uh, Worcester Astronomy Facebook group, if you want to continue the questions on there, that's a good platform to do that as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all so right. much. And hey, have a good night, all... everyone. Yeah, we'll see you all later. Clear skies. Hope you guys can get out and yeah. practice some of that star hopping tonight. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> all right, okay. take care. Bye.